Right. Good morning, everyone. Back to uh, Sanhedrin, chapter two. Exciting. Um, right. So who remembers what we were talking about at the end of last week's Shior? Nobody. That's good. Avril will remember because she wrote me a little message about it. We, should, we talked about a whole list of people that needed to be uh, to be in the town in order to have a... No, nah, that was a couple of weeks ago. That was the end of chapter one. We talked about Chalitza. We talked about Chalitza. Ah. And we did. And uh, if you remember, I promised you um, a little video uh, about Chalitza. Um, which I'd seen previously. And when I was looking for it this morning, I found it. I also found some other ones on it, which is really interesting. So let's um, uh, let's just go to the Gomorrah for a second and see what why we're talking about Chalitza uh, in the first place. Uh, so I will, uh, it's on page 101, Michael, um, in your book, and anybody else that has the uh, um, Steins out, Johnny's not with us this morning. He uh, uh, will listen to the recording. Oh, before I forget, I want to dedicate the Shior to the Ilui Nishmat Shalom Ben uh, Julia's um, Julia's uh, son-in-law, who sadly, sadly passed away um, yesterday or the day before. Uh, Shalom. Ben, I can't remember now off the top of my head, um, but his, uh, Julia's son-in-law, Ilui Nishmat, we were, I was at the Levaya and uh, I didn't know him, but the people who spoke, uh, it was clear that he was a very special person. Uh, and uh, our thoughts are with Julia and uh, Heidi uh, and all the family. So we wish them uh, Chaim or Kim, and we dedicate the Shield to his memory. Okay, so what were we talking about? Uh, let's go to the uh, let's go to the Gemara. It's on page one hundred and one. Uh, if you're in the Steinsalz, it will be in the screen uh, in one second. Michael's shaking his head. It's not on page one hundred and one. Is is that what you've got? Look at the screen, Michael. Is that what you've got on uh, page one hundred and one? That's what I've got on page one hundred and one. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. So we said in the Mishnah. Kohen Gadol, the high priest, Dan Vedaninoto, he can be a judge and he can also be judged. And we talked about that. Me'id Umeidin Oto, he can give testimony um, and he can have test he can have testimony given against him or concerning him. And we spoke about that. Um, somebody asked. Um, I can't remember who it was now, but somebody asked about, and he might have been you, Michael, about the the, the accidental murderer, the Cohen Goddard, who's an accidental murderer. No, maybe it wasn't you. Somebody asked, what happens to him? Because he has to go to the city of refuge, and he has to go to the city of refuge until the Cohen Gadol dies. Well, that's him. So how does that work? Anyway, turns out, um, when I looked up, it up, that we're only going to have to wait a few weeks or maybe a month or two until we actually deal with that in detail because it is on page 19b and we're on page 18a. So uh, if you, the answer to that question will all will be revealed in a few weeks uh, when we get to that bit in the Gemara. The Gemara asks exactly that question. I can't remember who it was that asked the question now, uh, but whoever it was was <laughs> spot on to ask that question. The Gemara asked the question and we will get the answers in a few weeks. But in the meantime, we ended off last week's year with this here. He can do chalitza and chalitza can be done to his wife. And we very briefly spoke about what chalitza was or is. Um, it is uh, where a man dies childless if he has a brother then that brother is obligated to marry the widow in order to um, um, preserve the name of the deceased. Uh, but, and that's called Yibum. Um, if he doesn't want to, 
uh, then he can do a get out clause called Chalitza. Nowadays, we don't allow Yibum. When I say we, I mean Ashkenazim don't allow it. There are some, um, what well, I call them hardcore Sfardim, that still do Yibum. But generally speaking, the vast majority of the Jewish world nowadays do not do Yibum, where the man marries the woman, uh, but they do Chalitza instead. And let's have a look at the biblical source for Chalitza before I show you a modern day Chalitza. So I will show you the uh, source. Anybody know where we will find uh, Chalitza? Uh, David will know. But before I ask David, where uh, anybody else know where we will find Chalitza in the Torah? Okay, there it is. David, where am I? Where have I put on the screen there? Oops, I think it's in the near the end of uh, Pastor Kitaitse. It is indeed in Parashat Kitaitse. There it is in Dvarim chapter 25. Let's have a look at it over here. Uh, verse 5. Um, when brothers live together. Not sure really what that means when they live together. I suppose when it, it, it means where where they uh, are all in, in, in the same place. Otherwise, you couldn't do this. But anyway, we'll, uh, we'll perhaps just gloss over that. One of them dies. And he doesn't have a son. The widow shall not be left outside. Outside to a strange man meaning an outsider. Instead, Yavama, Yavo Aleha, um, there's this word here, Yavama, which cannot be translated into English because there's no such thing. Yavama, excuse me. <laughs> Yavama means her person who does Yibum. So I suppose the English translation of Yibum is levy rate marriage, levy rate marriage. So um, Yavama would be her levy rate husband. Translated here, her husband's brother. Yavo Aleha shall marry her. She shall become his wife. The Yibama. And he shall, and shall be her levy rate husband. Why? The Haya, and it will be Habachor, the firstborn, Ashetelaid, who will be born from this union. Yakum al Shem Achiva, mate, will be established on the name of the dead brother, Veloyi Machesh Mom Israel, and therefore his name will not be rubbed out. Yimache. Where have you seen that word before? His name will not be rubbed out. Where have you seen that word before? Amalek. Amalek, that's right. Timche. Et Zecha Amalek. You shall blot out the memory of Amalek. So blot out. So Lo Yimachesh Mov Yisrael. This poor fellow who died childless, his name will not be blotted out from Israel. And now here we come to the Chalitza bit. What happens? If the man does not wish to take the, uh, um, the, the widow as a wife, and uh, the uh, woman shall go to the gates um, of the elders, to the elders. What happens at the gates of the city? That's the base din, right? The base din sits at the, the gates of the city. So when it says hasha'ara to the gates, it means she goes to base din, to the elders, to, in other words, to the, to the dayonim, the amra. And she will say, yavami la'akim la'achiv shem Yisrael, lo ava yavmi. The, uh, um, my, my levirate husband, my brother's, my husband's brother, me'ain, refuses. Where, where have you seen that word before? You're going to see it quite a few times in the Torah in the next few weeks. 
and you've already had it once uh, uh, in the Torah quite quite recently with a very long note on it. Only one of six in the whole of the Torah with this note on it. What am I referring to there? David, help us out. Yosef. That's right. Yosef refused to succumb to uh to Potiphar's wife's seductions. And the, the, the words is Vayamain. It's the same root over here as we've got over here. Uh where are we? Uh here. Uh Ma'ain. Vayamain. And he refused. He refused. And the, the interesting thing about it is that there's this Shalshelet note, which is uh, uh, the longest note that you, you lay, and it goes like this. It goes on for ages. It's a triple posair. And the idea there, the Forrest would say, is that although he refused, it was difficult. And he ummed and he ahed and he said, dear, yeah, yes and no, yes, no, no, I'm not going to do it. Um, and, and he refused. Uh, and uh, and it was very difficult for him. And he overcame his uh, um, human desires. Anyway, I digress. And she says, This man, my husband's brother, has refused to establish his brother's name in Israel. Lo ava. Yab me. He does not want to do yibum with me. He does not want to marry me. So then what do the uh, elders say? What do the day on him say? Vakarulo zikne iro. And the elders call him. Vidibruelav. And they speak to him. And they say, Oi, come here, you. Why are you not doing what you should do according to the Torah? Vaamar. And he says, Lo I don't want to take her as a wife for whatever reason. OK, so there's an out. Then his brother's wife, this, this woman that he's meant to be marrying, shall approach him. I want you to listen very carefully to the way the Torah describes the ceremony, because I'm going to show you the ceremony, the modern version of the ceremony. And it absolutely mirrors exactly what the Torah tells us. So the Nigsha Yevim Toilav. The brother's wife shall approach him. Le'enei has kenim. In the eyes of, before the eyes of the elders, so in front of the, uh, in front of the dayonim. Ve'chaltza na'alo me'al raglo. And he, uh, uh, and um, she takes off, she takes off his shoe. Okay, that's where the word chalitza comes from. She takes off. Lechlot means to take off. She takes off his shoe from his foot. And she spits in front of him on the floor. Yes, Avril's got a right face on there. Not very nice thing to do. It's, uh, it's, and the point of it all is that it is deliberately a humiliation for this man. Actually, it's a humiliation for both of them, um, but uh, it's particularly meant to be a humiliation for this man because effectively he's refusing to do a mitzvah from the Torah and marry this woman. Now, if it weren't for Chalitza, this woman would not be able to marry anybody else, this, this widow. Um, so what happens here? The Amra, and she will say, she spits in front of him, and she says, Kacha ish. So shall be done to the man asher lo yivne et beitachiv, who refuses, who will not build up the house of his brother. In other words, you're a naughty boy. You are not a good person. And this is what happens to people who do bad things like that. And she spits in front of him. Um, where have you seen those words before? Kacha yeasela ish. The story of Esther. Very good. Come on, tell us a bit more. Um, 
or when the king wants to reward Mordechai for for exposing the the plot because he was never rewarded the plot of the two guards, then he asks Haman um, what yeah what he should do, and he says Kach ish. Correct, hundred percent. Well done. Those are the words. So shall be done to the man that the, the, the king wants to honor. And then, of course, he parades him through the street with the uh, royal garments, etc. So here, Inter interestingly enough, uh, Johnny, the, the same musical notes are used in all three occasions. Ah, you're right. You're right. You're right. So shall be done. It's a uh, it's a yativ and then uh, a a, uh, a zakef katan. Very good. Yeah, I never I never noticed that before. But you're right. It is all the same notes. Only a, only an experienced Baal Kora would be able to know that off the top of his head and notice it. Uh, <laughs> that's the important thing. So kachayeh ish. So shall be done to the man that will not build up the house of his father of his brother. By marrying this woman, and she spits in front of him. Venikra Shemo be Yisrael, and so shall be called his name in Israel, Beit Chalut Hanaal, the house of the one whose shoe was removed. So this man is now forever known as a Chalitza man, right? Your name forevermore now is. Beit means the house of, or the family of, the family of the one whose shoe was removed. In other words, it's a stigma. It's a terrible stigma. And the, and the, the people, remember this was done in front of the, uh, at the gate there, in front of everybody. This was a public humiliation of this man. And they all shout out. They all shout out. Beit chalot sana'al. Beit chalot And they do it three times. When you do something three times, what does that mean? It's got chazaka. It's it's got strength and it sticks. So they shout out Beit Chalutza Naal. Okay, and that's the story of Chalitza. It's a humiliation all round, particularly for the man. Seems a bit unfair, uh, and that's why we've got a bit of a question in a minute when we talk about our Kohen Gadol. It's a bit unfair today because. It's not that the guy doesn't want to marry the, the, the woman. He may want to marry the widow. But he's not allowed. Based in don't allow it. And so they make him go through this humiliation, humiliating ceremony. It seems a bit unfair, really, that. Uh, but there you go. Right. So we've had a lovely description here, which I have uh, been at pains to, uh, 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 to, to go into detail about. Now let's have a look and see... Um, what we can see here is I'm going to show you first of all uh, a Hasidisha version, uh, a modern day Hasidisha version of the Chalitza ceremony. Let me see. Can you see the screen of all those uh, very hairy gentlemen in their um, in their Hasidic? These are Karlsberger. Hasidim, not to be uh, confused with the uh, with the lager. If Carlsberg did based butter din, this would probably be the best based din in the world. Maybe in Yovin. Right. I want to tell me if you can hear this. I'm going to play a bit of this. It, it's, it's six minutes long. I'm not going to show you the whole thing. But tell me if you can hear it. In a loser, when you did sweet, weist it as more as the coil was gedalia. Zees given the Aisha's Hamai. Did you understand any of that? Well, that was Yiddish, in case you didn't know, and it was a particularly um, strong accented Yiddish. Um, and what he said was, he, th there's your, th this is the, the base thing. These are the Zakanin. These are the elders. They look pretty old and elderly, don't they? So these are the elders that, we, that, that Sarah was talking about. And you can see all the people behind. 
uh, I'll show you in a little while. There's hundreds of them there. And that is Shar Ha'ir. That is the, you know, the, the city gates, as it were. That's where everybody congregated. I'll show you in a minute. What he just said, that gentleman, was the name of the person. He has Gazain, the Aishas Fundamais. He was the wife of the dead person, or she is the wife of the dead person. Okay, he's making the announcement as to who the parties are to this uh, Khalitsa. Okay, let's just let's see a little bit more now. Yitzchok Arya ben Yecheskel, he was the dead man. Um, and, and this fellow here, you can just see on the right hand side, you can see he's not got a, a Hasidish hat on, he's got a, a more Litvish hat on. Over here, can you see this guy here? He is the guy that's going to do Chalitza. He is the one that is stood in front of this based in here doing the Chalitza. Let's just go on a bit and see what's going on. Let me just uh, show you a little bit more over here. There we go. On as you should. There you go. You see that? Oh, but you don't see that. How about that? There you have Share Ha'ir. There you have all of the whole based in there. They're all of the whole town, as it were, those are all Carlsbergers. Can't, I can't get my head around this. These are all Carlsbergers. Uh, um, Carlsberger Hasidim at the base din of the uh, Chalitza. And you can see the kids at the front there. They're educated. They brought the kids in from Cheder as well, because this is a rare event. You don't see Chalitza that, that often. So um, so that's uh, what that, that's the Shar Ha'ir we've seen. Let's see what else I can show you on here. Um, right, there you go. There's the shoe. Can you see the, the guy in there has got the shoe in his hand? That's a special shoe. You need a, a special chalitza shoe. It's not any old sketches that you have to take off or your Nikes. There's got to be a special chalitza shoe. I, I showed you a picture of the special chalitza shoe at the end of the last year. But he's got one here. OK, let's just have a look and see what he's... He, Right, so there you can see, let me just stop that. You can see there he's got the shoe on and it's got to be tied in a very particular way. Now, can you see the, you see the guy's face? That's the guy that was stood in front of the, uh, of the base there before there. You can see him. Right. And that's his leg. And it's his right foot. And uh, they put this special shoe on and it's got special straps on it. And like everything else in, uh, in Jewish law, you have to do it absolutely correctly. You can't just put it on any old way. You can't put your filling on in the morning and just think, well, I think I'll put five things today or maybe seven tomorrow or six or whatever. No, it's got to be seven and we've got to be in the right way, the way you taught, etc. So the Chalitza shoe is no different. And these uh, Dionim here are all getting involved in, uh, uh, because it's not something that's done very often, they're all getting involved in how to do it and the whole halachas of it. And they're having a little discussion about which strap should go over what. Let's have another a little listen to what's going on. And he's not happy about the knot, but he's got a little look about that. Okay, so, that's, uh, so that's that bit. Let's show you now. Let's see if I can show you something else. Of course, you don't see the woman at all on this uh, video, not surprisingly. Um, There's uh, there's our gentleman looking on with uh, with great interest on on the whole proceeding. Anual, Beis, Chalit, Anual. Did you hear that? Beis, Chalit, Anual. Okay, that was the uh, the woman saying that you shall be called Bet Chalut Hanual, or in the Yiddish or in the in the Yiddish pronunciation Beis. Chalit Hanual. Um, she, that's her saying it. Now, if you listen carefully, they're all going to shout it out now. <laughs> so then they all shout out, Beis Chalut Hanual. 
Um, uh, and uh, and that is the end of the ceremony. You don't see her spitting on here because you, they don't want to show you the woman, Chas um, But I'll show you that in in a in another one in a sec. <laughs> Right, so that's that was that one. Now I want to show you, um, I want to show you one that took place in Tehran, of all places. Okay, this took place in Tehran. Have a look. Have a listen to this one. Now there you can see the shoe again on the man. Can you see that? The, the same type of shoe with the white things. And what you're seeing now, that hand belongs to the woman who uh, is taking his shoe off. That's the woman who's taking the shoe off. This is only 52 seconds, this bit, so I'm going to play you the whole, the whole 52 seconds. Have a listen to this. She takes the shoe off. And she throws it to the side. Now she steps back. And she throws it away. It has to be thrown to the right hand side with her right hand. There you go. Did you see that? She spat on the ground. You saw that? She spat in front of him. And now she gets to read this thing out. Let's just go back a second so you can hear exactly what she says. Asher, Asher. Hang on. Lo Asher. Lo Asher. Lo Asher. Lo Asher. OK, so you heard her say, it was much clearer there, you heard her say, Beit Chalutz Ana'al, and then the Dayanim who were on the, on the side there, they repeated it again, Beit Chalutz Ana'al, three times. Uh, you saw her spit on the ground. Uh, and the words that she said were exactly this. ish, asher lo those exact words that are written by Kodesh Baruch Hu three and a half thousand years ago were said there um, at Tehran uh, a, a couple of years ago, whenever that was. Um, and um, well, it can only have been a couple of years ago because the men have got masks on. It. Yeah, they've got masks to... on. It which must have been through uh, during Corona. That's right. So there's the very same words. Now that they, they probably, if Moshe Rabbeinu was there, he probably would have recognised those words. Not so sure he would have recognized the Carlsberger version. Uh, uh, he might have been able to work it out from, uh, uh, from the, the, with a Yiddish translator. But that's, that's uh, uh, Chalitza, which is done there. Um, it's, a, it's a rare ceremony. Uh, Philip Lehrer has done Chalitza. He's the only person that I know personally that has done uh, Chalitza. Um, and um, if you're interested, he will tell you about it in uh, very great detail. Uh, even if you're not interested in it, he'll tell you about it in very great detail. Uh, but anyway, so that's Chalitza. Um, and that's the, the, what we're talking about with the Kohen Gadol. OK, so uh, I found another one, by the way. I'll just show you this very, very briefly. Um, here's another one. This is also in New York. Um, but this is not quite so Hasidish because they've got a picture of the woman there. This is the woman um, who the guy doesn't want to marry um, or can't marry. Let's have a look at this one. You humiliate you want to humiliate him. Now you're humiliating him. That's the reason. <laughs> okay. So gather saliva in your mouth. Gather and saliva. This, you didn't Lock. eat or drink Lock. anything this morning, right? Gather saliva in your mouth. Now. What you have to do now is you have to spit on the ground and the day you have to see as it goes out of your mouth. Go away, go away. Wait, wait. wait. Not take your shoe away. Put, put your shoe on the side. Get away. Gather a lot of saliva in your mouth. Now spit in front of them. Oh, there you go. That was a cracker, wasn't it? She could be a footballer, that one. That was a great one. 
Anyway, she spits in front of him there and lifts it again now. Yeah. Everyone saw this line go out? Now, say the following. Kocha. Kocha. Yeah, you're saying. Yeah, you're saying. Laish. Laish. Asher. Asher. Loi. Loi. Yivne. Yivne. S. Base. Ochim. Binikla. Binikla. Binikwa. Shemoi. Be Israel. Base. Base. Halutz. Halutz. Hanaal. Hanaal. Base. Base. Halutz. Hanoal. Base. Base. Halutz. Hanoal. Take the shoe now to the ground. Now the. Throw it out, and we're all going to say halutz. No, give it in your right hand, right? Yeah. Well, hold it up and, and pitch it out to the outfield. Right hand, right hand, and all the way out, above, all the way out, as far as you can. <laughs> now wait, wait. We want to give you a bracha. There you go. You see the world. Yeshiva World News. There you go. Anyway. Um, there, there you have it. There, that, I think that was a nice one, that last one, uh, because you had a nice explanation in English, and you could hear very clearly what she was saying, um, and then they all said, uh, and you could see, actually, that was a very nice ceremony. She felt very relieved at the end of it. She hugged uh, her, her friend or uh, whoever it was that was with her. Um, and um, so there you have three different versions. You had a a Litvish version, a Hasidish version, and a uh, Tehrani version. But the beauty of it all is they all said, in their own different accents, the same words that were written uh, um, uh, in the Torah all that time ago. So that's Chalitza. Um, let's go back to the Gemara so uh, uh, we can now have a look at what the Gemara uh, is all talking about with this Chalitza. So... Um, there's the Gemara on the screen. Have you got it? Yeah, okay. So the Gemara, no, sorry, we're in the Mishnah. The Mishnah says, um, He can perform Chalitza uh, and he, um, or, can, and, and, or can have Chalitza performed literally. Really, that should not say he can perform Chalitza because he doesn't perform Chalitza. It's the woman that does Chalitza. The chalitza means to take off the shoe. It's a woman that takes the shoe off. He is very passive on all of this, uh, but we'll call it he performs chalitza. He can be the subject of chalitza, and his wife can be uh, um, can do chalitza, uh, um, or his brother can can uh, have a situation of chalitza with him with his wife if he were to die. Okay, so it's a both side thing. So if his brother dies childless. He can uh, go through a chalitza ceremony. And if he were to die childless, his brother can go through a chalitza ceremony with his wife. Now, I asked you at the end of last week's shiur to think, what is the havamina of the Mishnah? What is the uh, uh, thought processes of the Mishnah where it thinks that it has to tell us this? Why does the Mishnah feel that it has to tell us the, uh, that, that this can go on. Why is it not obvious? Why would we think that a Kohen Gadol might not be able to go through this process? Any suggestions? A Kohen Gadol is supposed to marry only marry somebody who hasn't been with a, with a man before. Okay, that's why he's not doing yibum. This doesn't yeah. involve him doing uh, going with a woman who's not been married, who's who's been married before. That's the whole point of this ceremony, is so that he doesn't marry the woman. I understand you've told me why he can't do yibum. That's a good answer why he can't do yibum. But why should he not be able to do chalitza? Why? What does the Mishnah have to tell us for that he can? Why would they think he might not be able to? Because if he can't do it by law or by sort of regulation, then they might think that he doesn't have to do chalitza. Ah, that's a different question, Hannah. That's a different question. The question, if the commissioner has said he must do chalitza, 
Then I would an, an, say, why must he do chalitza? What's other minute? Because he can't do yibum. Um, so you might think that he didn't have to do chalitza, but he must. That's a different question. You've answered correctly, but you've answered a different question. You've not quite answered my question, which is what's the have a minute of the Gemara? David, you have any suggestions? That's the meaning for a kohen god. I think that's absolutely right. I think that's the answer. The kohen gadol, the the high priest. What you should make him stand there with his shoe on, and this woman should come and spit in front of the kohen gadol. Chas v'chalila. You can't have that. That's a terrible thing to do to the kohen gadol. This is the high priest, the one who goes into the kodesh kadashim once a year and says the shame I'm a forash comes out of his mouth and he, as it were, is stood panim el panim with the Kodesh Baruch. It's very demeaning. It's humiliating. It's meant to be humiliating. That's what the rabbi said in the last video that I showed you. <laughs> it's meant to be humiliating. How can you humiliate the Kohen Gadot? So you might think, says the Mishnah underneath all of this, you might think that it's too humiliating for a Kohen Gadol to undergo that process. Says the Mishnah, no, a Kohen Gadol has to perform Chalitza if it, the situation uh, arises, despite the fact that it's demeaning and humiliating, because what is more important than the Kohen Gadol's honour is a mitzvah from the Torah. This is a mitzvah diorita, and I've been at pains to show you in all three versions that I showed you that the wording that they say is bidiyuk, exactly what the Torah tells us. So this is a ceremony which is fulfilling a Torah law by the fact that the Mishnah comes along and says, I understand that it's uncomfortable for you to think of the Kohen God or being humiliated in this way, but this is a Torah law, and, it, and that no man is above the Torah law. Um, and uh, we'll see, maybe a king is. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. I'm not going to give you any any uh, uh, any spoilers. But at this stage, no man, certainly not the Kohen Godel, is over the law. And if he has to do chalitza and be humiliated, so be it. Now, what about the other way around? Can I just ask a question? Yeah. Um, is it possible also that the the Torah is taking into account the woman's status? If he doesn't do chalitza, then she's left neither here nor there. She, she can't is, marry anybody else. Correct. She and, is an aguna. She is an aguna, and she's yeah, and she's left yeah you know, on her own and without the possibility of establishing a family. So the Torah is saying that the humiliation for the Kohen Hagadol is not as important as organizing the status of the woman and setting her free to live her life. I like that very much. Um, and I think I should appoint you to the based in Hagadol in Jerusalem, where they uh, deal very badly with the Agunat situation. Uh, if we had that sort of approach, whereby we went to the extremes to try and help these people, so much so that we were willing to humiliate the Kohen Gadol, then uh, we would not have the Aguna problem that we have uh, uh, today. And I'm sure you're right, Hannah. I'm sure that that is uh, a consideration that the, the Torah is telling us and that we should take on board. Thank you for raising that a very, very important point. Let me ask you now the, uh, the flip side. I understand why you might think that a Kohen Gadol could not do Chalitza, because it's demeaning. However, why would it be, what is the Havamina of the Mishnah, that his wife could not do Chalitza with her brother-in-law? So the Kohen Gadol dies childless, and this Kohen, his brother, is not the Kohen Gadol. So... Um, why can he not go? Why, why, why would you think that that ceremony between the coin, the dead Kohen Gadol's brother and the Kohen Gadol's widow 
would not take place. Why would you think that? Why does the mission have to tell us that you can do that? Because the corner of the doll's got a higher status. And in Judaism, you don't go down. Does it have something to do with the fact that you don't go down in the level of mitzvot that you do? That's why we, one of the reasons why we like from one to eight candles at Hanukkah and not from eight to one. You don't minimize. And she's already been married to the Kohen Hagadol. So anybody else is a blessed statue. statue. Okay, so, I think that's a fair answer. I think that's a fair answer. You might think, you might think that she is um, above the status of a regular coin because she's been married to the coin Gadol and therefore she is no longer, uh, you know, it's, it's beneath her status. I think that's a fair answer. Says the Mishnah, no, that's not the case. Cholets v'cholzin le'ishto, as I've highlighted there, he could do chalitza and chalitza is done with his wife. Um, and um, the uh, the halacha bit here, as a as a by the way, uh, um, um, tells us that this is actually the halacha uh, according to the Rambam. Right. So now next bit, we've already touched upon, upon this, but let's go and and look at it inside. Ume yabamin et ishto. If he dies childless, his brother, according to the Torah at least, does have the option of marrying her, does have the option of marrying her, for the reason that Hannah said, that we might have thought that it was below her state status, but it's not. He can, she can marry the brother-in-law who is a just regular Kohen, Avalhu Eno Meyabain. He, the coin Gadol, cannot do Yibum with his brother's widow. Why not? Why can he not do Yibum? Why can he not marry his brother's widow? And yet his brother can marry his widow. Don't seem fair. Yes, Michael. Well, the the Cohen Cattle can't marry a can't marry a widow. Full stop. And where a, they, where and is a regular the, where's the brother? Where the brother who's just purely a Cohen can? Okay, very good. Now let's take the opportunity of learning about what a Cohen can and can't do uh, in this regard. And um, so you just told me that a Cohen a Gadol cannot marry a widow. Who can a Kohen Gadol marry, Michael? Uh, a, 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 the, the daughter of a Kohen who's also a virgin. Doesn't have to be the daughter of a Kohen. Okay. But it does have to be a virgin. Okay. Uh, and what about a regular Kohen? Who can he not marry? A divorcee. Okay. And who else? A widow. No, he can marry a widow. A regular Cohen can marry a widow. A regular Cohen cannot marry an Isha Zona, a loose woman. Okay, how we uh, how we translate that, uh, uh, how we how we uh, interpret that, I should say, is a bit difficult. Uh, because you know we don't have a situation in 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 uh, Jewish law where uh, the rabbi just before he does hare at mekudeshet uh, st stands up and says, "Does any man know why this woman this man should not be taken together forever? Hold your peace and all that stuff that you see in uh, uh, in the films." Uh, and yes, she's a loose woman, Your Honor. Right? He's a Cohen and she's a loose woman. So what? How? What practical? Uh, law do we have today which is a result of a Kohen not being allowed to marry a loose woman, an Isha Zona. Anybody know? It isn't very nice. 
However, loses his Cohen status. He does lose his Cohen status if he if he marries a divorcee or he marries a loose woman. But how do we uh, interpret a loose woman, or, or at least one category of a loose woman, which is interpreted in today's halacha? David, do you know? Yeah, you do know. Think laterally. Think about who who. Okay, I'll help you out. Who is a regular Cohen not allowed to marry? You already told me a divorcee. Who else? Convertee. Yes, a convertee. A gioret. A gioret is not allowed to marry a Cohen, or the other way around, really. A Cohen is not allowed to marry a gioret. Why? Because it is assumed that every converted woman before she converted was a loose woman. It is assumed, you, it's called cheskes kashros or cheskes treifus, actually. It's assumed that every Jewish woman before she gets married is chaste and proper. And therefore, it's OK for a coin to marry a Jewish girl. It is considered, assumed, that every convertee, every female convert to Judaism before they converted was a loose woman and was not chaste and pure and therefore cannot uh, uh, marry a coin. Now, I ask you this question. How does that play out when a girl is converted when she is very, very young, as a baby, let's say? A baby girl that is converted when she's a baby, is she allowed to marry a coin? Logically, according to what I've just told you, the answer should be? Yes. Yes. Because by the time she came Jewish, it was not possible for her to have been a loose woman. However, is a coin allowed to marry a girl who converts as a child? Obviously, I wouldn't be asking you the question if the answer was yes. The answer is no. Why not? Why not? David? Is it because she was converted by the auspices of someone else um, and therefore she, uh, she didn't play any part in the conversion? It, it was enforced on her. Yes, that's more or less correct. It's, it's, it's almost like when you convert somebody as a child, it's a conversion al -tani. It's a conversion with a condition. On the condition that when she becomes of age, i.e. bat mitzvah, she confirms her desire to be a Jew. If she, at the age of bat mitzvah, turns around and says, I never agreed to this. Not interested. Don't want to know. Ta-ta. Then, that's it. Retrospectively, her gerus, her conversion, is null and void. And therefore, it's not a full conversion. She doesn't become fully converted until she confirms that. And given that it is possible for her to be a loose woman before the age of bat mitzvah, it's not a very nice thought, but it's a possibility. Uh, according to some, not me, but according to some, Rivka was three when she got married. Um, so um, we won't go there. But uh, it's certainly possible for a your, less than bat mitzvah girl to be a loose woman. So therefore, even if a girl is converted as a baby, uh, a coin cannot marry her. And that is as a result of uh, the, what we read in the Torah. Okay. Let's... Johnny, halachana maisa, if you have a regular convertee who goes through an orthodox conversion process, and we think she's doing it for all the right reasons. And five minutes after she steps out of the mikvah, she goes into McDonald's and has a Big Mac. Is the conversion automatically cancelled? 
There is a very, very difficult question. There are those who would say yes. Um, and, and by the way, I mean, not quite as obvious as that, but it happens all mm. the time. Um, about, well, I can't work it out because my math isn't great, but um, yes, I can. Don't be lazy, Lieberman. 39 years ago, 39 years ago, there was such a case in Manchester where a woman um, went through a conversion process um, and pulled the wool over the Dionym's eyes. She went to, to Mikvah, came out, and within weeks was, um, was uh, um, wearing clothes that she hadn't been wearing during the process of conversion, behaving in a way that she wasn't doing before, not keeping Shabbos, etc., etc. And it was very, and then she got married shortly afterwards to a bloke. Um, and now there are those um, who, and, and by the way, as a result of that case, Manchester based in refused to do any more Gayrus. That was the end of it. They've never done a Gayrus since then. It all now goes through London based in. Manchester said, we're having nothing to do with it. Uh, um, because they got their fingers burned, not their fault. They had the wool pull over their eyes. Um, so it happens very often, the story, the scenario that you've described, uh, David. There are those who would say, yes, Le Mafreya, retrospectively, that was not a, a, a proper gerus. And there have been attempts in Israel to uh, undo, as it were, gerus. It's a very difficult thing to do because... For a woman, the only thing you need al pi halacha to be to converted are two things, and they have to be two things at the same time. You have to go to mikvah, and you have to accept what's called kabbalat ol malchut shemaim. You have to accept that there is a God in heaven that He gave us the Torah, and you have to accept that that is the way, the correct way of life, and that I'm going to do my best to do it. If at that moment that she went in the mikvah, even though she might have had no intention of doing it before, if at that moment she had, and it's not unlikely, it's a very spiritual thing. If at that moment she had a, 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 a moment of spirituality while she's in the mikvah and she has that thought process that I accept Kabbalat Ol Malchut Shemaim on myself. And then she comes out of the mikveh, gets dressed and thinks, oh, my God, what have I done now? Um, uh, that's a Jewish girl. Al Pi Alocha. Now, the only one person that knows whether that's the case or not, and that's her. We can assume what we like. We can assume the fact that she came out of the mikveh and went to McDonald's. Um, that she was not genuine when she went in the mikvah. But that's a very hard thing to do. It's a very hard thing to undo it. So the answer to your question, David, is that there are those who would say that Le Mafreya, that is not a, a kosher gerus. <clears throat> and I've had trouble with that, by the way, um, when I've been a mile. I've had trouble with that where there have been so-called dodgy conversions um, and then we've got kids here and I've been asked to do a bris. And I said, well, I don't know whether this kid's a Jewish kid or not. Uh, it, it's an absolute minefield. Um, um, and uh, uh, my son in Australia, um, who um, is involved in Gayrus, he uncovered when he got to, to Australia over the last few years, he has uncovered a whole Pandora's box of Soros being caused by dodgy conversions. It's a right mess. And he has spent a lot of time and effort trying to cash up all this kind of uh, 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 this this nonsense. It's a really, really big, big, big problem. And that's why Manchester based in nearly 40 years ago decided that's it. We're not doing it. It's too difficult. We don't know. We can't trust people and we're not going to get involved. Um, it seems a little uh, bit strange that for one case, they must surely have had numerous cases before that, for one case, they actually uh, stop lo loads of other people who would want kosher uh, conversions. Converting I, think, I think the situation is that it wasn't one case. I think this was, you know, it, it happens over and over again. 
Um, and I think this was a particularly bad case. I remember it very well. Uh, uh, it was a particularly bad case. Um, it was a family who were um, basically cocking a snoot at the base then, and it, it was it was awful, really. And it was done with with almost like a smirk on their face, you know, ha ha ha, we've uh, pulled the wool over your eyes. It wasn't even done in a sort of snua way, uh, and it was it was there was a big fallout from it. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm, but I mean they they. They they used to used to refer everybody down to London after that. It was a bit like uh, my my partner in in practice, who was a a, a, a very very from Catholic, and uh, she would not prescribe contraception. It was against her um, uh, her religious uh, sensibilities, but she would you know tell the patients where they could go to see somebody else to get it sorted out. So it wasn't that they were preventing people from doing gay arrests, but they weren't getting involved in it. They, they, they would refer them down to London Best and say, you deal with it. We don't want to have anything to do with it. Um, because they, they had their fingers burnt. Um, so so the, the answer to your question, David, is it can be done, um, but it's not so straightforward. Um, because uh, uh, the point being that, uh, and the third thing for a man, by the way, is you have to have bris mila. Uh, for a man, if you have brismila, you go into the mikveh and you uh, and you accept ol malchut shemaim. You don't have to know the whole of shulchan aruch. You don't have. To, you just have to say, I want to go and uh, I, I accept it upon myself. Now, obviously, you have to learn what it is. You can't accept it upon yourself. You don't know what it is, so you have to have a certain amount of knowledge before you get to that stage. But the actual gerus is accepting ol malchut shemaim and going in the mikveh, and that's it. So it's very hard to undo that, really, because you don't know what's in somebody's mind at that particular moment. How did we get onto that? I don't know, but it was interesting. Point of clarification. When you yeah. said she, she went off and married a bloke, by bloke is a definition somebody not Jewish? No, no, she went off and married a Jewish man. That's why she converted in the first place, because she wanted to marry this Jewish bloke. Um, also, also, once... I was in a shiur, and the rav was talking about um, conversions and why would a person, or, and a person converting if they didn't really intend to do what they were going to do or what they commit themselves to do. And he said, well, once they've converted, they're Jewish and they're subject to all the punishments that God would give a Jew for doing the averas that they're, you know, that they're going to do because they weren't serious. What's your that's take right. on that? That's right. And, and in some ways, that's what the Dionim was saying. The Dionim was saying, you know what? We've got enough Jews that don't keep the Torah. We don't need any more Jews who are not going to keep the Torah. Right? If this one's going to keep the Torah, we'll have her or we'll have him. But if he's not going to keep the Torah, why do we need him? Let them be Goyim and be good Goyim. Why, why would you change a good guy into a you know, a, a Jew who's not keeping the Torah. Why would you want to do that? I understand where the Dayanim are coming from. Um, and the, child, the children or the grandchildren of that couple may become very from or whatever else. They may. Um, you don't they know may. Goes both and, ways. And you're right, they may. And and it has happened. And it's not, you know, it's not uh, out of the realms of possibility. However, um, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, a different, it's a very, very difficult um, situation. Conversions is, is not easy. And maybe one day I'll get my son to do a, a Zoom uh, shear on conversion because it's part of his uh, Dionys and uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a minefield. It really is a minefield. I, I always kept caught the back end of it. As a moil, I caught the back end of it because I had to deal with the, the fallout from the dodgy conversions. Um, um, uh, and, and, and there were many uh, that I came across over my career. I don't know how we got onto that. Um, oh, yes, I know how we got onto that. We got onto that because a coin cannot marry a convert because they are considered to be loose women. Okay, we'll continue next week with this very interesting topic of uh, um, Yibum and Koen Gadol and all that lot. Any other questions before we say goodbye? Yeah, where, where in Australia is your son? Perth. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah, Perth. I'm go I'm go oh, that reminds me. There will be no Sheol. Gamora Shield for the next three weeks because I'm um, next Wednesday I am going to Perth for two weeks so I will be away for three Wednesdays I might even be away for four Wednesdays because I think I might come back on a Wednesday I'm not sure 
Um, anyway, certainly not next week. I shall please God be flying to Perth next Wednesday. I'll keep you posted. Uh, there will be Tfilah and Tanakh Shiurim next week, but not Gemara. Thank you. Shavuot Tov. Shavuot Tov. Thank you.